hello and welcome again welcome again um, to this video series on the subject of quantum mechanics so last time we formulated um, the Schrodinger wave equation as an eigenvalue problem and today we are going to discuss some properties of operators that are very important um, for us when we're discussing quantum mechanics so the first thing we're going to have to note is that quantum mechanical operators must be linear what does that mean it means that if your operator um, sorry to be consistent with terminology I'll call it O bar or O hat if your operator acts on, on, on a combination of some functions and if the net result is that the operator acts individually on both of these functions then I say that the operator O is linear. Okay, if this condition is not met, then it's a nonlinear operator. So I, I took this C1 and C2 out because they're constants, they have nothing to do with the operator, so they come out and all is good in um, eigenvalue land. Okay, so I want to give you some examples to hi highlight this. So the first example is. Is d squared over dx squared a linear operator? Okay. Well, we know the we know the prescription that we have to use in order to find this answer. So if I act this operator on a combination of some functions and you can even remove the C I mean it, it is there for some practical purposes but let's keep the math simple for now and let's say we just have f1x plus f2x okay and actually you would see like it wouldn't make a difference if I put C's here right um, hopefully by this point you're comfortable with that math but if you're not I'm, I'm making things a little bit easier to visualize so as we know I can rewrite this as d squared dx squared f1x plus d squared over dx squared f2x. Therefore, since the operator is acting individually on both of these functions, I say that it is a linear operator. Now part b, and this is very classic example. Um, is the square operator linear so basically the square operator basically just says that whatever you have square it okay we use the same prescription um, so we have f1x plus f2x and we square it because the operator here is the square operator and what do we get? So we should all remember this identity a plus b whole squared is equal to a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. You can prove this identity. It's very easy. You just go a plus b times a plus b um, and you will come to this result. So I'm not going to go over that. But basically if we follow this prescription then we get f1x squared plus f2x squared so if we had just left things here then square would have been a linear operator but we have another term and that's 2 times f1x f2x so because of this term I say that this operator is non-linear right because you have an extra term um, we saw that if it is a linear operator we don't have any extra term the operator just acts on the first function it acts on the second function and all is good so is the square operator linear no it's not linear okay so that is important 
So now what I want to do is now that we have some idea um, that, you know, classical mechan or I mean, um, quantum mechanical operators are linear. Now we have that idea, I will, we will move forward and we will discuss some more ideas. So the whole, um, so one thing I forgot to mention is that classical mechanical quantities are represented as operators in quantum mechanics. And I hope to make this clear by showing you the Schrodinger wave equation. So the Schrodinger wave equation is that the Hamiltonian operator acts on this wave function psi and I get energy times psi again. So I said that quantum mechanical operators represent classical mechanical quantities, right? So here this operator the Hamiltonian operator actually just represents the total energy of the system. And of course the eigenvalue gives you that energy value, okay? So the operator acts on psi and then you get that energy value. So what, now the question might be, you know, what is the Hamiltonian operator? What, what form does it take? And it takes this form. The Hamiltonian operator is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So potential energy is pretty easy. It's just V as a function of X. It's, it's the classical analog, right? In classical mechanics, the potential energy is V as a function of X. In quantum mechanics, potential energy is a function V as a function of X. No change there. The only thing that changes um, is the idea of kinetic energy. So the operator that represents kinetic energy is negative h bar squared over 2m d squared over dx squared. So that's the only thing that's, that's, that you have to remember here and actually you do this a million and ten times and then this formula you remember it by heart. So if you guys want me to derive this formula you can leave it in the comment section but most uh, introductory courses and most um, you know introductory courses quantum mechanics they don't require a derivation of kinetic energy but if you want me to do it I will um, leave it in the comment section but for now I don't think it is a very good use of time. So the whole thing you should remember is that the Hamiltonian operator is given by the kinetic energy operator plus the momentum energy or plus the potential energy operator. So therefore I can rewrite the Schrodinger wave equation as negative h bar squared over 2m d squared over dx squared plus vx and this whole operator is acting on psi of x to give me e times psi of x. So operators always have to act on some function and here I notice that you know there's there's no function by this so I can distribute the psi inwards to get h squared over 2m d squared over dx squared psi of x plus vx psi of x and this is equal to e psi of x um, and this ladies and gentlemen is the wave equation written out in its proper form so you might be wondering you know what's this h bar h bar is simply h over 2 pi um, so you might be wondering, you know, why do we have to go h over 2 pi? What's the purpose of introducing a new symbol? And the answer is that most of the times in quantum mechanics, we'll be looking at things like angular momentum, angular velocity, and then we, we have a lot of 2 pi terms. Um, so just so that we don't have to write 2 pi again and again and again, uh, we will see that a lot of the times we'll end up with this form. So we just say that to save time, I'm just going to call it h bar. Okay, so now that all of these things are hopefully clear to you, 
I want to go on about um, I want to go on about discussing some more operators um, and and basically what they mean so I know the Hamiltonian operator and I'm just going to write it again so that we, they say repetition, repetition makes things permanent in one's mind. So I'm going to repeat as much as I can. So remember, the Hamiltonian operator is negative h bar squared over 2m. So the mass of the particle. So basically, it's describing a, a particle wave or, um, yeah, it's just a particle wave in a sense. So we have h bar squared d squared over dx squared. So now I don't need to write psi of x here because I'm just talking about the operator part. And I say that the operator is made up of the kinetic energy part and the potential energy part. It turns out that I can write um, the kinetic energy part separately and I give it the symbol T hat. So this is the kinetic energy operator. operator okay so you should recognize that here we'll only differentiating with respect to x but we have the y coordinate and we also have the z coordinate so sometimes we'll also be adding those as well to it so just to specify that we're only talking about the kinetic energy in the x direction I put a x um, subscript and this is simply equal to negative h bar squared over 2m d squared over dx squared. So remember, this is just the kinetic energy part, which is this. So now that that is done, how do I find other operators? For example, how do I find the momentum operator, right? So what I do is I think back to the classical mechanical equation. And in classical mechanics, um, you know, kinetic energy, which I write as EK, can be written as one half mv squared. What I can do is I can multiply and divide this by m, and I keep the v squared as it is. So what I get in this case, actually, this isn't right, my bad. Um, forget what I said. So what I can do is I can rewrite this by multiplying um, and dividing by actually it is M. Oh, I don't know why I can't figure this out right now. <laughs> Um, actually, it's a very easy calculation. Um, it is, it's, it's extremely late where I'm at, so I don't know why my brain is not working. Um, but essentially, this should be in the form of P squared over 2M. Oh, wow. I was thinking of this um, in a different form, but yes, the technique is the same. Okay, so you have 1 half MV squared. You multiply and divide by the mass. And so we can do this because, you know, they cancel each other out and it's just one. So it's, it, it is perfectly acceptable to rewrite um, kinetic energy as this, right? It doesn't harm the equation. So I can go ahead and I can write m squared v squared. So it's one half m squared v squared divided by m. But remember, if mv is equal to p, then of course mv squared is equal to p squared. So this is how I get p squared over 2m. So I can, I can rewrite the kinetic energy in terms of momentum. And this shouldn't be a surprise to you. I said that if you have the momentum, you can find any classical mechanical quantity. So here's how you get the kinetic energy from the momentum. But our point is, is that we have to find an operator for the momentum, right? How do I, so remember, all classical mechanic quantities are represented as operators, linear operators in quantum mechanics. So I make a substitution. I know that, I know that T of X is the kinetic energy operator, and I also know that it is equal to P squared over 2M. 
But remember, in in quantum mechanics, we don't we don't have um, p. We have the operator p. Okay, so it is equal to negative h bar squared over two n d squared over dx squared. The two m's cancel, and the momentum operator. So the momentum squared operator is just negative h bar squared d squared over dx squared. So this is not like this isn't our final answer yet because we are interested in momentum, not the momentum squared. So how do we interpret this? Basically, how we interpret this is that we can think of it, we can think of this um, as the we can think of this basically as the momentum operator. And this is in the x direction. We could think of it as basically um, it is it is acting twice, right? So what I mean by that is let us let's rewrite this in a different form. We know that i is equal to square root of negative one. So I'll, I'll also do a little bit of um, math work on complex numbers. But for now, you have to know that the square root of negative 1, we call it an imaginary number i. Because as you recall from basic math, you can never take the square root of a negative number. But it turns out that you can, and you, you just say that is imaginary number i. Okay, so i is equal to negative 1 square root. So therefore, i squared is equal to minus 1. So therefore, I could rewrite this negative as i squared h bar squared d squared over dx squared. Right? Or I could write this as i h bar d over dx and times i h bar d over dx. So what that means is that the momentum operator in the x direction is simply i h bar d over dx. Okay. So with this, I'm going to stop this video and I hope it helps you um, put things into perspective. So Next time, we'll, we'll discuss something um, a little bit deeper. With this, I just want you to kind of get an idea um, how we represent operators, what these operators are, how do we get the kinetic energy operator, how do we get the momentum operator. Um, so just make sure that you look at these things and you understand them.